Chapter Eleven, in which property gets into an improper state of mind. It was late in a drizzly afternoon that a traveller alighted at the door of a small country hotel in the village of N in Kentucky. In the bar room he found assembled quite a miscellaneous company, whom stress of weather had driven to harbour, and the place presented the usual scenery of such reunions great tall raw-boned kentuckians attired in hunting shirts and trailing their loose joints over a vast extent of territory with the easy lounge peculiar to the race rifles stacked away in the corner shot pouches game bags hunting dogs and little negroes all rolled together in the corners were the characteristic features in the place at each end of the fireplace sat a long-legged gentleman with his chair tipped back, his hat on his head, and the heels of his muddy boots reposing sublimely on the mantelpiece, a position, we will inform our readers, decidedly favourable to the turn of reflection incident to western taverns, where travellers exhibit a decided preference for this particular mode of elevating their understandings. Mine host, who stood behind the bar, like most of his countrymen, was great of statue, good-natured and loose-jointed, with an enormous shock of hair on his head and a great tall hat on the top of that. In fact, everybody in the room bore on his head this characteristic emblem of man's sovereignty, whether it were felt hat, palm-leaf, greasy beaver, or fine new chapeau. There it reposed with true republican independence. In truth, it appeared to be the characteristic mark of every individual. Some wore them tipped rakishly to one side. These were your men of humour, jolly, free and easy dogs. Some had them jammed independently down over their noses. These were your hard characters, thorough men, who, when they wore their hats, wanted to wear them, and to wear them just as they had a mind to. There were those who had them set far over back, wide-awake men who wanted a clear prospect, while careless men who did not know or care how their hats sat had them shaking about in all directions. The various hats, in fact, were quite a Shakespearean study. Divers Negroes in very free and easy pantaloons, and with no redundancy in the shirt-line, were scuttling about hither and thither without bringing to pass any particular results except expressing a generic willingness to turn over everything in creation generally for the benefit of Masser and his guests. Add to this picture a jolly, crackling, rollicking fire going rejoicingly up a great wide chimney, the outer door and every window being set wide open, and the calico window curtain flopping and snapping in a good stiff breeze of damp raw air, and you have an idea of the jollities of a Kentucky tavern. Your Kentuckian of the present day is a good illustration of the doctrine of transmitted instincts and peculiarities. His fathers were mighty hunters, men who lived in the woods and slept under the free open heavens with the stars to hold their candles and their descendant to this day always acts as if the house were his camp, wears his hat at all hours, tumbles himself about, and puts his heels on the tops of chairs or mantelpieces. Just as his father rolled on the green sward and put his upon trees and logs, keeps all the windows and doors open, winter and summer, that he may get air enough for his great lungs, calls everybody stranger with nonchalant bonhomie, and is altogether the frankest, easiest, most jovial creature living. Into such an assembly of the free and easy our traveller entered. He was a short, thick-set man, carefully dressed with a round, good-natured countenance, and something rather fussy and particular in his appearance. He was very careful of his valise and umbrella, bringing them in with his own hands and resisting pretentiously all offers from the various servants to relieve him of them. He looked round the bar-room with rather an anxious air and retreating with his valuables to the warmest corner 
disposed them under his chair sat down and looked rather apprehensively up at the worthy whose heels illustrated the end of the mantelpiece who was spitting from right to left with a courage and energy rather alarming to gentlemen of weak nerves and particular habits i say stranger how are ye said the aforesaid gentleman firing an honorary salute of tobacco juice in the direction of the new arrival well i reckon was the reply of the other as he dodged with some alarm the threatening honour any news said the respondent taking out a strip of tobacco and a large hunting-knife from his pocket not that i know of said the man chaw said the first speaker handing the old gentleman a bit of his tobacco with a decidedly brotherly air no thank ye it don't agree with me said the little man edging off don't eh said the other easily and stowing away the morsel in his own mouth in order to keep up the supply of tobacco juice for the general benefit of society the old gentleman uniformly gave a little start whenever his long-sighted brother fired in his direction and this being observed by his companion he very good-naturedly turned his artillery to another quarter and proceeded to storm one of the fire-irons with a degree of military talent fully sufficient to take a city what's that said the old gentleman observing some of the company formed in a group around a large handbill nigger advertised said one of the company briefly mr wilson for that was the old gentleman's name rose up and after carefully adjusting his valise and umbrella proceeded deliberately to take out his spectacles and fix them on his nose and this operation being performed read as follows ran away from the subscriber my mulatto boy george said george six feet in height a very light mulatto brown curly hair is very intelligent speaks handsomely can read and write will probably try to pass for a white man is deeply scarred on his back and shoulders has been branded in his right hand with the letter h i will give four hundred dollars for him alive and the same sum for satisfactory proof that he has been killed the old gentleman read this advertisement from end to end in a low voice as if he were studying it the long-legged veteran who had been besieging the fire-iron as before related now took down his cumbrous length and rearing aloft his tall form walked up to the advertisement and very deliberately spit a full discharge of tobacco juice on it there's my mind upon that said he briefly and sat down again why now stranger what's that for said mine host i do it all the same to the writer of that r paper if he were here said the long man coolly resuming his old employment of cutting tobacco any man that owns a boy like that and can't find any better way of treating on him deserves to lose him such papers as these is a shame to kentucky that's my mind right out if anybody wants to know well now that's a fact said mine host as he made an entry in his book i've got a gang of boys sir said the long man resuming his attack on the firearms and i just tells em boys says i run now dig put just when you want to i never shall come to look after you that's the way i keep mine let em know they are free to run any time and it just breaks up their wanting to more and all i've got free papers for em all recorded in case i gets killed up any of these times and they know it and i tell you stranger there ain't a fellow in our parts gets more out of his niggers than i do why my boys have been to cincinnati with five hundred dollars worth of colts and brought me back the money all straight time and again it stands to reason they should treat em like dogs and you'll have dogs works and dogs actions treat em like men and you'll have men's works and the honest drover in his warmth endorsed this morsel of sentiment by firing a perfect feu de joy at the fireplace i think you're altogether right friend said mr wilson and this boy described here is a fine fellow no mistake about that he worked for me some half dozen years in my bagging factory and he was my best hand sir he is an ingenious fellow too he invented a machine for the cleaning of hemp 
a really valuable affair it's gone into use in several factories his master holds the patent of it i'll warrant ye said the drover holds it and makes money out of it and then turns round and brands the boy in his right hand if i had a fair chance i'd mark him i reckon so that he'd carry it one while these year knowin boys is allers aggravatin and sarcy said a coarse-looking fellow from the other side of the room that's why they gets cut up and marked so if they behave themselves they wouldn't that is to say the lord made em men and it's a hard squeeze gettin em down into beasts said the drover dryly bright niggers ain't no kind of vantage to their masters continued the other well entrenched in a coarse unconscious obtuseness from the contempt of his opponent what's the use of talents in them things if you can't get the use on em yourself why all the use they make on it is to get round you i've had one or two of these fellers and i just sold em down river i knew i'd got to lose em first or last if i didn't better send orders up to the lord to make you a set and leave out their souls entirely said the drover here the conversation was interrupted by the approach of a small one-horse buggy to the inn it had a genteel appearance and a well-dressed gentlemanly man sat on the seat with a coloured servant driving the whole party examined the newcomer with the interest with which a set of loafers in a rainy day usually examine every newcomer he was very tall with a dark spanish complexion fine expressive black eyes and close curling hair also of a glossy blackness his well-formed alkaline nose straight thin lips and the admirable contour of his finely formed limbs impressed the whole company instantly with the idea of something uncommon he walked easily in among the company and with a nod indicated to his waiter where to place his trunk bowed to the company and with his hat in his hand walked up leisurely to the bar and gave in his name as henry butter oaklands shelby county turning with an indifferent air he sauntered up to the advertisement and read it over jim he said to his man seems to me we met a boy something like this up at beeman's didn't we yes masser said jim only i ain't sure about the hand well i didn't look of course said the stranger with a careless yawn then walking up to the landlord he desired him to furnish him with a private apartment as he had some writing to do immediately the landlord was all obsequious and a relay of about seven negroes old and young male and female little and big were soon whizzing about like a covey of partridges bustling hurrying treading on each other's toes and tumbling over each other in their zeal to get master's room ready while he seated himself easily on a chair in the middle of the room and entered into conversation with the man who sat next to him the manufacturer mr wilson from the time of the entrance of the stranger had regarded him with an air of disturbed and uneasy curiosity he seemed to himself to have met and been acquainted with him somewhere but he could not recollect every few moments when the man spoke or moved or smiled he would start and fix his eyes on him and then suddenly withdraw them as the bright dark eyes met his with such unconcerned coolness at last a sudden recollection seemed to flash upon him for he stared at the stranger with such an air of blank amazement and alarm that he walked up to him mr wilson i think said he in a tone of recognition and extending his hand i beg your pardon i didn't recollect you before i see you remember me mr butler of oaklands shelby county y yes yes sir said mr wilson like one speaking in a dream just then a negro boy entered and announced that master's room was ready jim see to the trunks said the gentleman negligently then addressing himself to mr wilson he added i should like to have a few moments conversation with you on business in my room if you please mr wilson followed him as one who walks in his sleep and they proceeded to a large upper chamber where a new-made fire was crackling and various servants flying about putting finishing touches to the arrangements when all was done and the servants departed the young man deliberately locked the door and putting the key in his pocket faced about 
and folding his arms on his bosom looked mr wilson full in the face george said mr wilson yes george said the young man i couldn't have thought it i am pretty well disguised i fancy said the young man with a smile a little walnut bark has made my yellow skin a genteel brown and i've dyed my hair black so you see i don't answer to the advertisement at all oh george but this is a dangerous game you're playing i could not have advised you to it i can do it on my own responsibility said george with the same proud smile we remark en passant that george was by his father's side of white descent his mother was one of those unfortunates of her race marked out by personal beauty to be the slave of the passions of her possessor and the mother of children who may never know a father from one of the proudest families in kentucky he had inherited a set of fine european features and a high indomitable spirit from his mother he had received only a slight mulatto tinge amply compensated by its accompanying rich dark eye a slight change in the tint of the skin and the colour of his hair had metamorphosed him into the spanish-looking fellow he then appeared and as gracefulness of movement and gentlemanly manners had always been perfectly natural to him he found no difficulty in playing the bold part he had adopted that of a gentleman travelling with his domestic mr wilson a good-natured but extremely fidgety and cautious old gentleman ambled up and down the room appearing as john bunyan hath it much tumbled up and down in his mind and divided between his wish to help george and a certain confused notion of maintaining law and order so as he shambled about he delivered himself as follows well george i suppose you're running away leaving your lawful master george i don't wonder at it at the same time i'm sorry george yes decidedly i think i must say that george it's my duty to tell you so why are you sorry sir said george calmly why to see you as it were setting yourself in opposition to the laws of your country my country said george with a strong and bitter emphasis what country have i but the grave and i wish to god that i was laid there why george no no it won't do this way of talking is wicked unscriptural george you've got a hard master in fact he is well he conducts himself reprehensively i can't pretend to defend him but you know how the angel commanded hagar to return to her mistress and submit herself under the hand and the apostle sent back onesimus to his master footnote genesis sixteen the angel bade the pregnant hagar return to her mistress sarai even though sarai had dealt harshly with her second footnote philippians one ten onesimus went back to his master to become no longer a servant but a brother beloved don't quote bible at me that way mr wilson said george with a flashing eye don't for my wife is a christian and i means to be if ever i get to where i can but to quote bible to a fellow in my circumstances is enough to make him give it up altogether i appeal to god almighty i'm willing to go with the case to him and ask him if i do wrong to seek my freedom these feelings are quite natural george said the good-natured man blowing his nose yes they're natural but it is my duty not to encourage em in you yes my boy i'm sorry for you now it's a bad case very bad but the apostle says let every one abide in the condition in which he is called we must all submit to the indications of providence george don't you see george stood with his head drawn back his arms folded tightly over his broad breast and a bitter smile curling his lips i wonder mr wilson if the indians should come and take you a prisoner away from your wife and children and want to keep you all your life hoeing corn for them if you'd think it your duty to abide in the condition in which you were called i rather think that you'd think the first stray horse you could find an indication of providence shouldn't you the little old gentleman stared with both eyes at this illustration of the case 
but though not much of a reasoner he had the sense in which some logicians on this particular subject do not excel that of saying nothing where nothing could be said so as he stood carefully stroking his umbrella and folding and patting down all the creases in it he proceeded on with his exhortations in a general way you see george you know now i always have stood your friend and whatever i've said i've said for your good now here it seems to me you're running an awful risk you can't hope to carry it out if you're taken it will be worse with you than ever they'll only abuse you and half kill you and sell you down the river mr wilson i know all this said george i do run a risk but he threw open his overcoat and showed two pistols and a bowie knife there he said i'm ready for em down river i never will go no if it comes to that i can earn myself at least six feet of free soil the first and last i shall ever own in kentucky why george this state of mind is awful it's getting really desperate george i'm concerned going to break the laws of your country my country again mr wilson you have a country but what country have i or any one like me born of slave mothers what laws are there for us we don't make em we don't consent to them we have nothing to do with them all they do for us is to crush us and keep us down haven't i heard your fourth of july speeches don't you tell us all once a year that governments derive their just power from the consent of the governed can't a fellow think that hears such things can't he put this and that together and see what it comes to mr wilson's mind was one of those that may not unaptly be represented by a bale of cotton downy soft benevolently fuzzy and confused he really pitied george with all his heart and had a sort of dim and cloudy perception of the style of feeling that agitated him but he deemed it his duty to go on talking good to him with infinite pertinacity george this is bad i must tell you you know as a friend you'd better not be meddling with such notions they are bad george very bad for boys in your condition very and mr wilson sat down to a table and began nervously chewing the handle of his umbrella see here now mr wilson said george coming up and sitting himself determinedly down in front of him look at me now don't i sit before you every way just as much a man as you are look at my face look at my hands look at my body and the young man drew himself up proudly why am i not a man as much as anybody well mr wilson hear what i can tell you i had a father one of your kentucky gentlemen who didn't think enough of me to keep me from being sold with his dogs and horses to satisfy the estate when he died i saw my mother put up at sheriff's sale with her seven children they were sold before her eyes one by one all to different masters and i was the youngest she came and kneeled down before old masser and begged him to buy her with me that she might have at least one child with her and he kicked her away with his heavy boot i saw him do it and the last that i heard was her moans and screams when i was tied to his horse's neck to be carried off to his place well then my master traded with one of the men and bought my oldest sister she was a pious good girl a member of the baptist church and as handsome as my poor mother had been she was well brought up and had good manners at first i was glad she was bought for i had one friend near me i was soon sorry for it sir i have stood at the door and heard her whipped when it seemed as if every blow cut into my naked heart and i couldn't do anything to help her and she was whipped sir for wanting to live a decent christian life such as your laws give no slave girl a right to live and at last i saw her chained with a trader's gang to be sent to market in orleans sent there for nothing else but that and that's the last i know of her well i grew up long years and years no father no mother no sister not a living soul that cared for me more than a dog nothing but whipping scolding starving 
why sir i have been so hungry that i have been glad to take the bones they threw to their dogs and yet when i was a little fellow and laid awake whole nights and cried it wasn't the hunger it wasn't the whipping i cried for no sir it was for my mother and my sisters it was because i hadn't a friend to love me on earth i never knew what peace or comfort was i never had a kind word spoken to me till i came to work in your factory mr wilson you treated me well you encouraged me to do well and to learn to read and write and to try to make something of myself and god knows how grateful i am for it then sir i found my wife you've seen her you know how beautiful she is when i found she loved me when i married her i scarcely could believe i was alive i was so happy and sir she is as good as she is beautiful but now what why now comes my master takes me right away from my work and my friends and all i like and grinds me down into the very dirt and why because he says i forgot who i was he says to teach me that i am only a nigger after all and last of all he comes between me and my wife and says i shall give her up and live with another woman and all this your laws give him power to do in spite of god or man mr wilson look at it there isn't one of all these things that have broken the hearts of my mother and my sister and my wife and myself but your laws allow and give every man power to do in kentucky and none can say to him nay do you call these the laws of my country sir i haven't any country any more than i have any father but i'm going to have one i don't want anything of your country except to be let alone to go peaceably out of it and when i get to canada where the laws will own me and protect me that shall be my country and its laws i will obey but if any man tries to stop me let him take care for i am desperate i'll fight for my liberty to the last breath i breathe you say your fathers did it if it was right for them it is right for me this speech delivered partly while sitting at the table and partly walking up and down the room delivered with tears and flashing eyes and despairing gestures was altogether too much for the good-natured old body to whom it was addressed who had pulled out a great yellow silk pocket handkerchief and was mopping up his face with great energy blast it all he suddenly broke out haven't i always said so the infernal old cusses i hope i ain't swearin now well go ahead george go ahead but be careful my boy don't shoot anybody george unless well you'd better not shoot i reckon at least i wouldn't hit anybody you know where is your wife george he added as he nervously rose and began walking the room gone sir gone with her child in her arms the lord only knows where gone after the north star and when we ever meet or whether we meet at all in this world no creature can tell is it possible astonishing from such a kind family kind families get in debt and the laws of our country allows them to sell the child out of its mother's bosom to pay its master's debts said george bitterly well well said the honest old man fumbling in his pocket i suppose perhaps i ain't following my judgment hang it i won't follow my judgment he added suddenly so here george and taking out a roll of bills from his pocket-book he offered them to george no my kind good sir said george you've done a great deal for me and this might get you into trouble i have money enough i hope to take me as far as i need it no but you must george money is a great help everywhere can't have too much if you get it honestly take it do take it now do my boy on condition sir that i may repay it at some future time i will said george taking up the money and now george how long are you going to travel in this way not long or far i hope it's well carried on but too bold and this black fellow who is he a true fellow who went to canada more than a year ago 
he heard after he got there that his master was so angry at him for going off that he had whipped his poor old mother and he has come all the way back to comfort her and get a chance to get her away has he got her not yet he has been hanging about the place and found no chance yet meanwhile he is going with me as far as ohio to put me among friends that helped him and then he will come back after her dangerous very dangerous said the old man george drew himself up and smiled disdainfully the old gentleman eyed him from head to foot with a sort of innocent wonder george something has brought you out wonderfully you hold up your head and speak and move like another man said mr wilson because i am a free man said george proudly yes sir i've said master for the last time to any man i'm free take care you are not sure you may be taken all men are free and equal in the grave if it comes to that mr wilson said george i'm perfectly dumbfounded with your boldness said mr wilson to come right here to the nearest tavern mr wilson it is so bold and this tavern is so near that they will never think of it they will look for me on ahead and you yourself wouldn't know me jim's master don't live in this county he isn't known in these parts besides he is given up nobody is looking after him and nobody will take me up from the advertisement i think but the mark in your hand george drew off his glove and showed a newly healed scar in his hand that is a parting proof of mr harris's regard he said scornfully a fortnight ago he took it into his head to give it to me because he said he believed i should try to get away one of these days looks interesting doesn't it he said drawing his glove on again i declare my very blood runs cold when i think of it your condition and your risks said mr wilson mine has run cold a good many years mr wilson at present it's about up to the boiling point said george well my good sir continued george after a few moments silence i saw you knew me i thought i'd just have this talk with you lest your surprised looks should bring me out i leave early to-morrow morning before daylight by to-morrow night i hope to sleep safe in ohio i shall travel by daylight stop at the best hotels go to the dinner tables with the lords of the land so good-bye sir if you hear that i'm taken you may know that i'm dead George stood up like a rock and put out his hand with the air of a prince. The friendly little old man shook it heartily, and after a little shower of caution, he took his umbrella and fumbled his way out of the room. George stood thoughtfully looking at the door as the old man closed it. A thought seemed to flash across his mind. He hastily stepped to it and, opening it, said, Mr. Wilson, one word more the old gentleman entered again and george as before locked the door and then stood for a few moments looking on the floor irresolutely at last raising his head with a sudden effort mr wilson you have shown yourself a christian in your treatment of me i want to ask one last deed of christian kindness of you well george well sir what you said was true i am running a dreadful risk there isn't on earth a living soul to care if i die he added drawing his breath hard and speaking with a great effort i shall be kicked out and buried like a dog and nobody'll think of it a day after only my poor wife poor soul she'll mourn and grieve and if you'd only contrive mr wilson to send this little pin to her she gave it to me for a christmas present poor child give it to her and tell her i loved her to the last will you he added earnestly yes certainly poor fellow said the old gentleman taking the pin with watery eyes and a melancholy quiver in his voice tell her one thing said george it's my last wish if she can get to canada to go there no matter how kind her mistress is no matter how much she loves her home beg her not to go back for slavery always ends in misery tell her to bring up our boy a free man and then he won't suffer as i have tell her this mr wilson will you yes george i'll tell her but i trust you won't die take heart you're a brave fellow 
trust in the lord george i wish in my heart you were safe through though that's what i do is there a god to trust in said george in such a tone of bitter despair as arrested the old gentleman's words oh i've seen things all my life that have made me feel that there can't be a god you christians don't know how these things look to us there's a god for you but is there any for us oh now don't don't my boy said the old man almost sobbing as he spoke don't feel so there is there is clouds and darkness are around about him but righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne there's a god george believe it trust in him and i'm sure he'll help you everything will be set right if not in this life in another the real piety and benevolence of the simple old man invested him with a temporary dignity and authority as he spoke george stopped his distracted walk up and down the room stood thoughtfully a moment and then said quietly thank you for saying that my good friend i'll think of that end of chapter eleven